Okay, so I'm going to first use Bernadette. Bernadette is an electroacoustic instrument. Fancy term for um, an acoustic instrument that has a pickup and can be run through different effects. So first of all, let's just start with um, the instrument itself. It was made by Eric Casido. Okay, so first things first, I, I use um, a Venue DI, which is in, um, the, probably the most recent LR bags, um, um, kind of full spectrum DI. But I use it as um, an EQ um, for any kind of violin playing that you're going to run amplification um, through you're going to find quickly that tone becomes excruciatingly problematic. And by the way, your best solution is EVS. These guys really know what they're doing. And um, I'm not just saying that to say it. I'm saying it because it's real. This is one of the few places in the world I know where you can actually say, I'm an acoustic player or I'm an electric player, but I'm having issues with tone. I'm a touring musician, and um, that means, well, think about it this way. If you are a musician who plays different halls regularly, you know that the hall becomes an extension of your instrument, like it or not. This problem is magnified hundreds of times when you're dealing with amplification. I won't go into the specifics of that. Suffice to say, oftentimes for touring musicians, whether it's a stadium, a large convention hall, black box theater, you're dealing with the tone coming out of your rig, your rig going to the house, your house, how it sounds on stage to you and your um, peers, and then how it sounds to the audience. So there's multiple perspectives on this, and Bill Balcom, the great American composer, at the end of the day, he always would say to me, Daniel, you've got to find ways to make things performer-proof. Well, you have to find ways <laughs> to make things um, violin, timbre, tone-proof as well. Okay, so let's start with the basics of um, tone. I've, um, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have EVS. I didn't have anyone who could really tell me what to do. I was really starting from scratch. I was taking guitar um, pickups and throwing them on my violin. Jean-Luc Ponty ruled the day. I eventually found out he was playing a Zeta instrument and you know so on and so forth but still this wasn't this wasn't there was no Mark Wood there was no EVS there was no Boyd Tinsley there was you know there was nothing so the good thing about that is that I would I was forced as a teenager to play in clubs and I would immediately ask people well how did it sound and generally they would say well it sounded pretty bad <laughs> the tone <laughs> because I was running things through guitar amps and no sense of you know even into a microphone, so on and so forth. All right. So let's get started with just the the fact that this is this instrument's less than a year old. It's about a year old, and it's really not made. The pure acoustic sound is okay, but it's immature and it's developing, and that's not really what it's made for. It's made to be amplified. So I use a venue uh, full spectrum DI, which I love. It, and, but I use it, I don't use it as a DI, I use it as EQ. So you can see that I'm using it pre-everything. I'm going from my instrument to the DI. And, and just so we're clear, um, when I'm playing into Pro Tools, if I'm doing something at home, I always run a microphone so I get the pure acoustic sound, and I run a line from this DI into Pro Tools, always. When we're dealing with, uh, so this, by the way, this is a hollow-bodied instrument. When we're dealing with solid-bodied instruments, if you will, or kind of hybrids, <laughs> right? For lack, you know, there's a resonating um, aspect to this. Is that is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
we got some great guys here who are advising me. Um, but this is a hollow body instrument, and I'm using venue first. I use that first. And you're going to find a lot of sound guys get a little confused by that. They want to run a line from here. Don't let them, because it's going to bypass all of this. It will. Okay? So my actual sound comes out at the end of my chain, and it's going to this great Fishman, which I'm just a loud box mini um, uh, amplifier. Um, so if I were doing the show, boom, mic right there to the house. Okay? So, for the purposes of, of our demonstration, I want to hit home the fact that, um, for me, this solves a lot of problems. So it's a lot of problems. One of the best things that, that's great about this, uh, she will go unmentioned, but there's a very famous violinist who was playing on a six-string um, instrument in concert. I think a string broke or something. She had to tune, and I think they had to stop the orchestra because she couldn't hear herself. This person will go unnamed, sorry. It was, a, it was a New York Times review, actually, a couple years ago. And my good friend Tracy Silverman and I, we were commenting on it. Wow, all she needed was an on-stage LED tuning device. And that's exactly what this has. This is great, you know. So there's really no excuse for you to ever be out of tune, even with the orchestra or whatever. The band's going full throttle. You can still tune, and you can see it, big it, LED. All of that to say that I tune... The great thing about this particular LED is that I can tell when I'm at A442. I actually sometimes go up to 443. Yeah. Um, I do that because I find that, well, it, it depends on the hall. It, if, it's, if I know I've got hot lights on me, I'll hit 441 because these lights are going to, I don't know how specific we want to get today, but suffice to say, I can control the tuning with this venue. I can see where I'm at A440. I can see when I'm at A442. Sometimes as high as A443. I do tune a little high. I just find a little more success with it. Okay, so now what you're hearing is the instrument going through the venue, going through all of these fences. They're off, they're naked, they're, they're, they're not engaged, going straight to the fishman. Sound. The, one, the, the nice thing about this immature instrument is that I'm, a, I'm actually, even right now, I'm not hearing so much of the instrument itself. There's a lot of problems with hollow body instruments, which I'll get to in a second, but there's also a lot of advantages. It's all about your tone. Next in my line is a wah pedal, basic wah pedal. <laughs> So, you know. So let's talk about, I'm using uh, a jewel, uh, a Cotabo jewel. Um, the reason I love it so much, there's a couple of different reasons. This, this isn't theatrics. I need both hands. I need it quickly. Even putting it down isn't quick enough. I do put the bow in my mouth a lot. It's, it's really practical reality for me because I do all sorts of um, different, um, essentially plucking um, um, extended techniques, right? Um, this is all part of, part of, you have to develop your own personal performance practice. I'm trying to use, I'm oscillating between street terms and ivory tower conservatory terms. So those of you who know, know what I'm talking about. You've probably been taught pizzicato in the simplest sense. Your better teachers maybe taught you the meat of your finger, the tip of your finger. It probably didn't go further than that. One of the best advantages of, of amplified playing is that you can amplify all of those artifacts and all of those aspects of the string, particularly between the bridge and the fingerboard. This is all very, this is your Zion. This is very valuable ground. Every inch, every millimeter of this between the bridge and the, and, the, and the fingerboard can be explored by you with simple amplification. Actually, let's just start with the absence of pitch. I call it breathing. Once we get to reverb, that's going to make a lot more sense. But let me just show you what I'm talking about. Sol Ponticello. Off. Or normal. But. Sounds 
almost process, but it's not. That's just bow pressure and proximity to the bridge. You can do the same thing with pizzicato. Now I can heighten that with my walk. Ponticello pizzicato, if you will. And I'm using, I use my wand not so much for the kind of cliche, I shouldn't say cliche, the typical, you yeah. know. Yeah, that 70s type of sound. <laughs> I, I really use, it is a filter. It's a high pass and low pass filter alternating and oscillating. I oftentimes use it as a filter. Okay, so that's, um, and this just so we can hear the little... If you're a guitarist or um, any kind of electric player, I'm using all Boss pedals because they travel really well, very reliable. I do not link them, I do not sequence them in the way that Boss or any guitarist ever would. This is my personal sequencing. I find this works really well for me. And that's a big thing, again, to experiment with. Um, I'm using the tuner actually for power. Um, I also use it as a secondary muting device. I switch instruments a lot in concert. So the great thing about the... the the um, venue is that it kills the signal. Okay, very important because if you you'll find out if you don't kill the signal. So you, you go you don't you don't kill the signal. You get it can be really problematic in live performance. Okay. So next in line is for me is a delay. holding the, the, the um, wah pedal in a certain place just to cut out the lower frequencies. So you can actually use your wah as a real-time EQ.
use it again as, you know, it's all candy, it's all... Um... <laughs> distortion you're actually bringing into the into the mix. I use a metal zone because I can I can control the amount of distortion. I can also control the EQ of the distortion. I usually have to cut the highs back a little bit. Venue that there's a knot switch that if I had feedback I can find the frequency and I can basically kill it. And again, it's so great to have this type of power and this kind of sweeping, sweepable EQ with this knot switch that they introduced in this model. And um, it's great for any kind of feedback problems, phasing problems, so on and so forth. <laughs> between hollow body and full body is I do a lot of percussive effects. Uh, playing behind the bridge is actually playing in front of the bridge. So I'm really using the violin like a drum and that the hollow body nature of the aspect amplified really gives you a great drum sound um, in a lot of different ways. This doesn't mean as much here, but when I'm in a big house, I can run my instrument through sub speakers, and it literally gives you a drum sound. But even now, you can get a sense of it.
Okay. So finally, I just want to give you a sense of how this translates to how this translates to a solid body instrument. Please, what's this model? It's a, <clears throat> called a bridge lyra. This is a bridge lyra. It's not very expensive at all. Very. I just started playing it myself. Very affordable. Very attractive. Very good looking. Feels good. <laughs> Not a big learning curve. Very focused sound. Again, here's the sound. Not a lot coming off of the instrument itself. Not a lot of sound coming off the instrument itself. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the lows a little bit on the amplifier. start to get into um, lower registers, subtones, and a real breadth and depth and dynamic, of just a massive range, you know. And um, it has influenced the way I play um, a four-string violin. It has influenced the way I compose. Um, I think one of the best things about amplification, actually, is that it really, it's tangible. As a violinist, Traditional four-string acoustic playing is is as wonderful and historic and traditional as that is, and that, those are all things that are very important. It is lim it is literally and figuratively limited. As a composer, you can actually start to get into those other uh, sounds and those other ranges of other instruments, and that actually gives you tangible knowledge as a composer. <laughs> So again, just real quick, is to show you what the what the sounds are like in a more uh, solid body instrument. Same um, um, techniques.
This is all excruciatingly personal, and you can, and I look forward to you doing it too, and I hope we can jam together someday. So if you have any questions, can I tell them the website? We actually have a question. Oh, great. Okay. Um, we have a question. Someone said, it seems like you're using a pick. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, um, well, there's a couple things connected to that. I'm not using a pick. Um, you can. You have to be very careful. Um, I can show you the difference. No, <laughs> got a pick right here. You can use a pick. You can use a credit card. A credit card, actually, believe it or not, it's, it's the same kind of, of feeling. Um, here's a pick. Um, 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 and here's a not using the pick. Flesh or using no, I'm using the nail. Now, this is really specific. I use three different areas of my nail. Um, I use the very tip of my nail. I, I can amplify it for you this way. You can really hear it. This is the whole nail. This is a nail, a little bit of flesh. To a like a higher thing. That's just the flesh. You can get the same thing with the wah. It's a different. In other words, I'm really exploring the the upper registers, all those different tones. It's, this is the wah um, wide open. Off. Tip of my finger. So, I mean, it's endless. Um, I'm inspired a lot by guitarists and. people that have not invested in oh. a number of effects, say if you're working with a multi-effects pedal, sure. um, oh, how, in like how do box? you, yeah. obviously you, you've decided that in order to be more flexible, you, it's better to be discreet. Yeah. Do you have any advice for people that are working with a multi-effects pedal? I know some of them, they're like, great. like, like yeah. the ME70, you have exactly. discrete sections where yes. you can do something like this. Yes, and all those pod pedals and, and things like that. Um, and I see some here too. I mean, I think Digitech. Is, you probably. The M70s over there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the box, yeah. I see that. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> those those jam boxes. Those. I mean, you know, it's whatever's best for you. This is about a third of my rig. I mean, oh my right? God. <laughs> yeah, no. But I've, I've got. I mean, I I. It depends on the project. Like with DJ Spooky, I literally had, you know, about three times, including jam boxes and two pre uh, pre um, preamps and. You know, it depends on where I am, and, you know, that's not something I would tour with. This fits in my backpack. This all fits in my, literally, in the, in the suitcase that, that I 
to, that I bring with me onto the plane. There's a little trick. I'll, I'll tell you one quick trick about this. And they let you on the plane? Well, this is how you do it. <laughs> Technically, this case and that means that one of these has to be checked. But here's the trick, y'all. What they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, check that, and they're going to put a tag on it, and then they're going to let you walk down the jetway, and you say nothing. You don't say yes, you don't say no, you let them do what they're going to do, and as you're walking down the jetway, you take off that tag, you get onto the plane, and <laughs> say nothing, and that's the key, because if you call the ruckus, he or she's going to make sure they check that bag and don't let them check your instrument. The other thing is, um, so yeah, I get them both on the plane. Sit in the back, right, window. Every airline's different. <laughs> but, um, yeah, these are, these are ways to, to get your instrument on, 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 on to, onto a plane. And, of course, if you do have to check something, I keep... The only thing that travels in that bag are my effects and one simple outfit for the stage. So if that bag gets lost, in this, I always have one or two effects and two quarter-inch cables. You get, and, oh, and my venue. My venue never leaves my side. And I have had cases where that has come a day or two late, but I've done the gig with this instrument, one or two effects, and my venue going direct. I just found out tonight from the great people here, that the great American guitar virtuoso and composer and singer-songwriter, Prince, he goes direct. He doesn't even use an amp. goes direct into the system. I think it's great. Um, you know, it's all about what is best for you. I do a lot of traveling. This travels well. This is consistent. And this has allowed me to quickly establish my tone, establish my sound, and give a good, good show for the audience. And um, I can't say enough about the staff here at EVS, how knowledgeable they are. Everything affects your tone, from the chords to the strings to, to these pedals. And the brilliant men and women here at EVS can really help Sorry, you. Sorry, y'all. Yeah, on yeah come on, man. This is, this is a team this effort. This is going to be the group show. Yes. So thank so, you to Daniel. Thank, thank you, so Blaze, for, for years of support. I'm Blaze Keeler. Every, everybody introduce awesome. themselves. Take Susie. Susie. Hey, Susie. nice to see you. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. All right. So uh, thank you for joining on our very first live stream. Thank you to Daniel. Yeah. And uh, as I said at the, at the opening, get his album. Um, it's so available. Collide. Yeah. It's available how? Uh, iTunes. iTunes. Rhapsody, CD okay. Baby. And he's got other CDs out there as well. Some amazingly creative. Get inspired. Keep playing. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, and also thanks to the folks at Center Stage for helping us out. <laughs> yes. Thank okay. you. We don't have, <laughs> okay. Now we have Susie and, and okay. uh, Chris in there. Okay. Definitely want to say thanks to the folks for, from Center Stage for having Daniel back year after year so that we can have him here at the shop. <laughs> yes.